The Soviet K-class submarines, nicknamed Katyusha by sailors, were created thanks to efforts of Mikhail Rudnitsky, the chief of the submarine department at the Institute of Naval Shipbuilding. At the beginning of 1935, he presented his own project of a cruiser and fleet submarine to the USSR Naval Command. The specifications of this submarine were so promising that even before the final technical project had been approved, the decision was made to construct a large series of ships of this class. The author of the project, which was sometimes nicknamed Rudnitsky's Cruiser in his honor, managed to create a ship with very extensive and varied combat capabilities that were a perfect match for the Soviet naval doctrine of that time. It was supposed that, in order to perform the tasks of a fleet submarine, she would stay within a specified area and patrol it. If an enemy appeared, she would let the main Allied forces know about it. Then, using her advantageous situation, she would be able to deploy mines in the path of the advancing enemy fleet. After the hostile suffered some losses in this minefield, the sub would carry out a torpedo attack. After this, she would disengage and wait for the enemy to sail away from the quadrant. Thanks to her higher speed, she would then move to another position and re-engage the hostiles there. That's the action algorithm of a fleet submarine. Simultaneously, large submarines were to carry out cruiser missions, acting on sea communications in remote areas far from home bases and shores. The technical project of a cruiser and fleet submarine was developed and improved for a further two years. In December 1936, the first three ships were laid down in Leningrad. This series of submarines received the number 14. In the Navy, they were designated as the K-Class. Specifications of K-class submarines. Length, 97.6 meters. Beam, almost 7.5 meters. Mean draft, 4 meters. Submerged displacement, 2,104 tons. The boat has a double hull. Maximum diameter of the pressure hull, 5.3 meters. Thickness of the pressure hull, 18 to 22 millimeters. The submarine is divided into seven compartments. The first and seventh, torpedo compartments with crew berths. The second, bow battery compartment. The officer's mess hall and five single cabins for the commanding officers were located on its deck. The first group of accumulator batteries was installed in the hold. The third, control room with the conning tower on top of it. The artillery magazine found its place in the compartment's hold. The fourth, aft battery compartment. The petty officer's mess hall and 24 crew bunks were on its deck the second group of batteries was installed in the hold. The fifth, diesel compartment. The sixth, electromotive compartment. Armament, 10 533 mm torpedo launchers, six at the bow and four aft, with two of them in the superstructure. Ammunition, 24 torpedoes. Artillery armament, two 100 mm B-24PL dual-purpose guns, two 45mm 21K dual-purpose guns, two 7.62mm M1 removable machine guns. The boat carried 20 EP ground anchor mines, developed for fleet submarines, which could be deployed with a mining device located underneath the control room. Power plant, two diesel engines, 4,200 horsepower each. A diesel generator, 800 horsepower, two electric engines, 2,400 horsepower each, two groups of accumulator batteries, 240 elements each, maximum surface speed, 21 knots, maximum submerged speed, 10.3 knots, submergence depth, 80 meters, maximum depth, 100 meters, Cruising range at 10 knots, surfaced 7,500 miles, submerged 11.5 miles. Endurance, 50 days. Maximum time submerged, 72 hours. Crew, 66 people. The boat had it all. A long cruising range, high speed, powerful torpedo armament with 10 torpedo launchers. And moreover, she could set mines. But in order for a sub to have good underwater maneuverability, you need one kind of hull shape. To make her agile on the surface, you need a slightly different hull shape. And if you plan to use the boat as an artillery platform, you need a third kind. 
Soviet engineers, much to their credit, managed to combine all this in one ship. However, all these advantages came at a price. And the price they paid came in the form of the overall lightening of the submarine's hull. Moreover, when the engineering blueprints were being prepared, errors in the calculations for the metacentric height and boat's load were discovered, which caused stability issues. To fix them, engineers had to remove the gun shields, make the plating of superstructure and conning tower railing out of aluminium, and reduce the thickness of the outer hull to 6 millimeters. The reduction of the outer hull thickness had very negative consequences. Any explosions of depth charges nearby would cause welded seams to crack, watertight fuel tanks would be compromised, and leaking fuel would expose the submarine's position. Even rough seas could be enough to severely damage the hull. For example, after K-1 was hit by a Force 10 storm, a superstructure shifted to such a degree that it jammed the capstan and bow rudders. However, these individual technical drawbacks of Katyusha's weren't that important compared to the shortage of prepared crews. By the end of the 1930s, the USSR hadn't managed to organize the fully-fledged training of submarine officers directly in naval schools. The Navy, meanwhile, had only two training squads for underwater operations, which prepared commanders and specialists for submarines. The problem was that these schools weren't able to prepare the necessary number of commanders and specialists at the rate at which the shipbuilding industry was producing new submarines. By the summer of 1941, the Soviet submarine fleet included 212 ships, 85 in the Pacific Fleet, 67 in the Baltic Fleet, 44 in the Black Sea Fleet, 16 in the Northern Fleet. 118 of them were either under repair or at different stages of construction. The remaining 94 were complemented with crews that underwent practical training directly on them. The most important thing, a crew required time to master all the machinery. To this end, a training program was developed. The training program for submarines, adopted in 1938, consisted of 21 tasks. Here are some of them. Task 2, controlling a submarine when submerging, carrying out submerged maneuvers and surfacing. Task 13, attacking a ship sailing along an alternating course with torpedoes from a long initial range. Task 21, joint maneuvers of a group of submarines when evading the enemy. Ships whose crews had complemented all the tasks were considered fully combat ready. The highest certification of a submarine was to successfully complete a submerged attack against a high-speed formation of warships with anti-submarine escorts, moving along a zigzag path. The Soviet submarine fleet had very few certified subs. So the reality was that despite having a large number of boats at our disposal, only half of them, at best, were combat ready. Only two submarines were fully prepared for combat in the Baltic Sea, 19 in the Black Sea, and none in the Northern Fleet. On September 17th, K-21 was commissioned into the Northern Fleet, and after very tight and intensive combat training, she went out on her first war patrol. During the autumn of 1941, Katyusha's had to adapt to sailing conditions in the northern Arctic waters first of all. The Barents Sea tested the endurance of the ship and her crew on every cruise. It turned out that surface speed was very much dependent on the sea conditions. At Force 5 roughness, which is quite characteristic for Arctic latitudes, speed dropped twofold, while during a storm, the submarine could list up to 50 to 55 degrees. To help submarines stay on course and maintain their position, a system of automatic movement stabilization was installed. It was able to adjust both course and depth, and was also called the autopilot. However, the electric motors of this system were too noisy, and sailors would often disable it during missions and switch to manual control. For the German troops in the far north, shipments by sea were virtually the only source of supplies. That's why these routes were the primary target of Soviet submarines 
throughout the war. However, the enemy didn't conduct large ocean convoys near Norwegian shores, and the K-class cruiser submarines were designed to hunt exactly for this type of convoy. Active transportation was carried out by small groups of ships with modest tonnage that sailed along the shoreline, taking cover in fields. Often, these were common motorboats and mobilized fishing vessels, and it made no practical sense to spend torpedoes on them. In September 1941, on their way back from a combat cruise, the commanding officer responsible for artillery on K-2 suggested firing a blank shot from their main gun when entering the harbor, in honor of their victory. Later, this tradition was adopted by all submarines of the Northern Fleet. It's worth noting that the K-class submarines scored their first and last victory with artillery fire. In terms of artillery armament, Katyusha's surpassed all Soviet submarines of that time. Their 100mm dual-purpose guns were even sometimes used for anti-aircraft defense at home bases. Of course, these submarines found the main application for their guns at sea and near enemy coasts. The events that occurred at the end of 1941 during a combat cruise of K-3, when she was helmed by Lieutenant Commander Malafeyev, presents a very characteristic example of this. On December 3, K-3 discovered a small convoy off Hammerfest that included the cargo ship Altkirch and three submarine chasers. The Soviet submarine carried out an attack but failed. All torpedoes missed their targets. Moreover, by firing a salvo, the boat revealed herself and was immediately spotted by the enemy escorts. The Germans set chase to K-3 at once and in just a couple of minutes, dropped around 30 depth charges. While evading them, Katyusha hit the ground three times and finally laid on the bottom, with all noisy mechanisms disabled. However, the attack continued, and each new series of charges with the correct depth setting could have become the last for K-3. Water started gradually leaking into the pressure hull, but enabling the drainage pumps would cause too much noise. In this critical situation, the captain had one extreme measure left. To surface and engage in an artillery battle. With her fifth salvo, K-3 hit the aft of one of the German chasers where the death charges were stored. The ship went under almost instantly. The second chaser, armed only with 20 mm autocannons, hurried to disengage by setting a smoke screen. The third ship was too distant, and her salvos fell short of the submarine. K-3 disappeared beyond the horizon before the enemy's eyes. Later on, it was found out that an enemy coastal ship had hit a mine cluster deployed by the sub a week prior to those events. Thus, the first mission of K-3 in the Northern Fleet turned out to be very successful. This hatch was used to load anchor mines, which were stored in the hold in mine and ballast tanks. By the way, the submarines of this class proved themselves to be excellent mine layers during the war. More than half of the enemy tonnage they sank was from their mines. But what's most staggering is the audacity of Soviet submariners, who entered narrow Norwegian fjords with unfamiliar fairways on their almost 100-meter-long ships. Often, they were spotted by lookouts on the coast, but cool-headedly ignored all of their signals and requests and deployed mine clusters and minefields across enemy communication routes. Submarine K-1 commanded by Captain 2nd rank Mikhail Avgustinovich, holds the absolute record of the Northern Fleet for the number of enemy ships destroyed by mines. During the course of her service, this boat deployed 146 mines that destroyed five transports and two guard ships. What's interesting is that the number of confirmed victories of Augustinovich surpassed the number of claimed victories, a very rare exception in the Soviet underwater fleet. 
Post-war studies showed that the effectiveness of submarines was often overstated. It wasn't caused by their commander's ambitions, but rather the lack or absence of resources and means to verify the results of an attack. When newspapers or radio informed people of the victories of the Soviet submariners, they didn't require verification anymore. In 1942, when the Red Army suffered a number of crushing defeats on other fronts, the Soviet people badly needed to know that somewhere at least, the enemy was getting successfully hit. Лодка пробралась к вражеским берегам во внутренние воды врага. Торпеды атаки! Аппараты тут! He launched four torpedoes at the German task force at battleship Tirpitz. Ten spare torpedoes were stored in the forward torpedo room and six more were loaded and ready in the launchers. Initially, submarines of this class weren't equipped with a system that enabled bubble-free torpedo launching, which was a substantial tactical disadvantage. The enemy could detect a salvo fired from a submarine and perform evasive maneuvers. Moreover, by firing several torpedoes underwater, the boat risked disclosing her position. For this reason, some Soviet captains fired torpedoes from the maximum effective range. On K-21, the system of bubble-free fire was installed in March 1942. By the way, it was partially Nikolai Lunin's initiative to install the system for bubble-free torpedo launching. He was an experienced submarine officer who had completed five war patrols on submarine Shah 421 and carried out seven torpedo attacks. On March the 4th, he was appointed as K-21's captain. An interesting fact, the order giving him command of K-21 came exactly one day after the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, which awarded him the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Thus, he first became a hero, and the very next day was given command of the largest and most powerful submarine in the Russian Navy. Everything started with submarine cruisers. I mean, a plethora of new things were introduced on ships after World War II, and the first ships to accommodate such novelties were cruiser submarines. Hygiene was improved, and more bunks were installed. Each sailor, petty officer, midshipman, and officer had their own bunks. Water distillers were installed for the first time, two distillers, each of which was able to provide around 40 liters of distilled water per hour. The most interesting part, stall showers were installed. You know, in practice, such things as distilling water, heating water, and everything related to it is just wasted energy. Almost no commander would agree to spend energy on water and potentially spend the resources required for a torpedo attack or the chance to flee from enemy ships after an attack. I mean, from submarine chasers and destroyers. Our grandfathers served on submarines in the north in severe and spartan conditions. Moreover, the submarines of the time didn't even have any heating. On June the 18th, 1942, K-21 started her fifth raid. For 10 days, the submarine cruised along the northern coastline of Norway, searching for targets. During the night of June 28, Lunin received an order to move to another location, close to Cape Nordkin, to cover convoy PQ-17. Several days later, the Allies learned that a task force of surface ships, headed by Tirpitz, had set sail. The largest German ship was a highly valuable piece on the board, and by losing this piece, the Kriegsmarine would lose their advantage in the north. 
Both opposing parties knew that, which was why the German command valued concealment and secrecy most of all while planning their operations. The Allies, in their turn, took all possible measures to detect Tirpitz. In the evening of July 4, convoy PQ-17 received the fatal order to spread out. The German squadron wasn't aware of this and continued along their previous course. By the second half of the next day, the squadron had neared Cape Nordkin. The characteristics of the listening sonar installed on K-21 weren't that impressive, but Lunin was lucky enough to have a good sonar operator. At 1622 on July the 5th, 1942, he reported to the officer of the watch that he had heard some indistinct noise. The noise was getting louder at a course angle of 30 degrees on their starboard. The commander ordered the sub to turn and extended the periscope several times in order to identify the source of the noise. As the boat continued moving towards them, dim outlines transformed into large ships escorted by destroyers. Lunin declared a torpedo attack state on K-21. The enemy was following an irregular course. In other words, the ships were moving in formation, an anti-submarine formation. It meant there was a group of destroyers in front of three large ships, which were moving in a front formation. The task of the destroyers moving ahead of large ships in a front formation is to detect submarines. Not just detect submarines, but force them to change their course. Either a submarine is detected, or she will try to avoid the collision at periscope depth. Therefore, when a submarine submerges and then surfaces, she will have only one chance to attack, because the ships are moving at high speed. Initially, Lunen planned to attack using the bow torpedo launchers, but at 1750, he raised the periscope and saw that the squadron had changed the course. This made a torpedo attack from the bow launchers impossible. The commander made a decision to launch the aft torpedoes. A lack of experience in attacking fast-moving targets with strong escorts, imperfect tracking devices, errors in analyzing target motion, and the risk of being revealed with an additional extension of the periscope, all these and other factors made it harder to prepare a torpedo attack. Nevertheless, Lunin made a second attempt, a risky one, to launch torpedoes at a receding target from an obtuse angle. According to his calculations, the distance was maximum but acceptable. At a particular moment, K-21 was surrounded by the escort ships and could have been detected. Lunin gathered all the data for a launch, extended the periscope and waited for the target to enter the computed zone. The parameters he had indicated that the attack would be successful. He launched four torpedoes at the German task force, at battleship Tirpitz. Immediately after the torpedo salvo, K-21 submerged to 30 meters and left the attack area at full speed. Approximately an hour later, a radiogram was received at the Coastal Command HQ of the Northern Fleet. At 1800, latitude 71 degrees 25 north, longitude 23 degrees 40 east, attacked enemy ships comprising battleships, Tirpitz and Scheer and eight destroyers attacked battleship Tirpitz, her two blasts, commander of K-21. Meanwhile, in the north, far away from K-21, German aviation and submarines were pillaging convoy PQ-17. Soviet destroyers left the northern fleet bases and aircraft took off from the coastal aerodromes to search for the enemy. The radiogram from Lunin was still being decoded on the coast, which is why nobody knew the exact location of the German task force. Nevertheless, everyone understood that they had to be detected at any cost. At 1916, the German squadron was detected by the crew of the Il-4 airplane from the 2nd Guards Composite Air Regiment. Severe weather conditions obstructed the flight. Low clouds and fog made it almost impossible to detect the enemy ships. But the persistence of Soviet pilots in fulfilling their mission was rewarded. The pilot noticed a small gap between the clouds, plotted the course in that direction, and found himself right above the enemy forces. The scout immediately sent a message about detecting a German squadron comprising 11 ships and following a course of 65 degrees at a speed of 10 knots. The error in determining the squadron's speed played a crucial part in the coming events. 
The text of the decoded radiogram from K-21 and data from the reconnaissance aircraft led to the conclusion that the speed of the German squadron had been reduced because one of the ships had received serious damage. It proved that Lunin's attack had been successful. After our British allies received the message about detecting the German task force, they radioed it in such a way that guaranteed the Germans would intercept it. And they did intercept the message in two hours and decoded it. The message was decoded both by the task force and on the mainland. The German command saw the message as a reason to abort the operation. That message had basically eliminated the secrecy that was the top priority of the German command. They realized that they had been discovered. Moreover, there were messages from aviation and submarines stating that the convoy had been dispersed and was being successfully destroyed by aviation and submarine forces. So the capital ships had nothing to do there. In the evening of July 8, the Soviet Information Bureau transmitted a message saying that the submarine under the command of Captain Second Rank Nikolai Lunin had scored two torpedo hits on German battleship Tirpitz. The news about the torpedo attack on the largest German ship was published not only in the main Soviet papers, but a corresponding note was also released in the foreign press. This was why, the following day, when K-21 arrived at the base, the whole world was already aware of the heroic deed of the submarine and her commander. By the fall of 1942, after the events of the fifth raid had been reviewed in detail, Nikolai Lunin and his submarine K-21 were decorated with the Order of the Red Banner. Over time, that attack had created a plethora of speculations and assumptions, and finally became a legend that still causes many arguments. It's all clear from the historical perspective. The specific facts which are now available to everyone who's eager to study them undeniably suggest that the attack took place, but that it was unsuccessful. However, the attack itself was a heroic deed in any case. Lunian did everything he could and everything he had been taught. The first torpedo attack failed, but he still took a risk and attempted a second attack. That was the first and only attack by our submarines on large enemy surface ships. In November 1943, Nikolai Lunin became commander of the 1st Submarine Division of the Northern Fleet. Six months later, he was sent to the Military Naval Academy. He graduated from the academy after the war ended. Submarine K-21 had seven more war patrols, primarily for laying mines. At the time of her last raid, the conning tower of the submarine was decorated with the number 17, the number of her victories. As a matter of fact, the combat cruises of submarine K-21 ended on April 12, 1944. She required mid-life repairs, and after being docked, she didn't take part in any further military actions until the end of the war. That might have saved the life of the submarine and her crew, because she was the only submarine out of six boats of her class that survived the war. After being decommissioned from the Navy in 1954, K-21 was converted into a training facility where submariners practiced survivability skills. In 1981, the Military Council of the Fleet proposed to make submarine K-21 a memorial to honor all the submariners who had died during the war. Four compartments were rebuilt as a museum, so just the forward torpedo room, forward battery room, and control room with the conning tower remained almost unchanged. The victories of submariners from the Northern Fleet are sacred to me, no matter what anyone says. The numbers can be exaggerated or underrated. To my mind, it would be an insult, not only to me, but to the veterans who are no longer here with us, when someone who only read the numbers would say, come on, how many ships did you sink? You say? You just sailed about at sea, and that's it. In wartime, huh? In the conditions of the North, a patrol by any submarine is already a heroic deed because their crews always left the base with a one-way ticket. They never knew whether they would return or not.
It's not hard to understand the idea of the memorial's creators. A famous warship, the only preserved K-class boat of the Northern Fleet, united with the coast that she once defended. It symbolizes the memories of the heroic deeds of Soviet submariners that are preserved by today's sailors and the connection which unites them.